Hey everyone, it's Al the Dog Trainer. Hey, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm here with uh, my good friend and coworker uh, Mandy. Mandy, say hi. Uh, and uh, on the other side of the camera, uh, the folks that y'all can't see, uh, we have uh, Gracie uh, and we also have Jade who is going to be uh, directing this. I'm really hoping that this evening that we can get through uh, without any technical issues. For any of you guys that have been watching us for a while, uh, we always seem to have some kind of technical issues. So we've really simplified our setup as much as we possibly can. But hey, I just want to say a big thank you to, to everybody that's watching. A big thank you to my team uh, that's helped me put this together, uh, to my clients, all your amazing dogs. So excited to be here tonight. Um, tonight is not one of the Ask Al episodes. Actually, I wanted to do something uh, different this evening. Um, and really, uh, really one of the you know, one of the things I'm very passionate about is obviously teaching you guys and helping you to understand your dogs so that way you can help help them uh, become happy and reliable. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to go over some of the things that I like to teach uh, every single one of my new clients and the things that I continue to really double down on because I really believe the the things that uh, that I'm going to be, you know, teaching Mandy and Mandy knows some of this stuff because she does a lot of the a lot of the videos you guys are watching on social. Um, but I'm just going to go over some of these key pieces of information. I'm going to ask her some questions, um, you know, as it relates to her dogs. But as we're doing this, if you end up having a question, uh, we're not going to immediately get to them. But if you have a question as it pertains to the information that I'm talking about, uh, please uh, please feel free to drop that down in the comments below. So before I get started, I do want to mention one more thing. Um, we are having a giveaway at the end of the live show. So I'm going to be giving away uh, something pretty nice at the live show. So, okay, now I'm going to need some help here remembering what we decided. What exactly did we decide that we were going to do? Are they going to... So yeah, they need to comment at the when we announce. We're gonna announce the winner at the end of the show. They have to comment. So to enter the con, so, oh, so oh. to enter the yeah. contest, you need to comment. Just say hi, or just let us know that you're here during the during the live show. At the end of the live show, which I'm not sure exactly when that is. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pick one viewer at random, and that person will have. One minute, one minute to reply, Longoria House Rocks. If that person replies with Longoria House Rocks in that one minute, you'll win the prize. If not, we're going to go through three names. We'll go through three names and so, and, uh, or until the prize is won. So again, to be able to win the prize that we're going to give away, make sure you leave a comment at some time during the live show. And then once we call your name, you have one minute to uh, to reply back on the on the live uh, on the live stream, Longoria House rocks, and you will win the special prize. I will announce the prize when I announce the winner at the end. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask uh, I'm going to ask Gracie real quick to go. Okay, where where was, was that on the all that sound? Is that coming from over there? Yeah. Okay. Will you go over there and ask uh, ask that to be turned down just a little bit? Yeah, just trying to make sure that we're not having any audio issues, guys. All right, so so here we go, guys. You know, the, so Mandy, here's really what I've been teaching clients, and you've never really actually heard this at any at any point. The way that I'm going to deliver it, um, like it's a little rehearsed because I actually see say this to so many people. So I think the the main issue that people have with their dogs is that they don't actually understand that there are languages involved in communicating with their dogs. So like here, obviously I'm speaking English. If I went into Spanish right now, and if you don't speak Spanish, it it's, becomes very difficult for you to be able to understand what it is that I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So everybody, for everybody that's watching and for Mandy's benefit too, uh, if you have a dog, these next four pieces of information are really important. Okay. So here's the four languages, and I'm going to order them in the order of most important to least important. Okay. So the single most important language to a dog is pressure. The way I actually tell this to, to people is I want you to think about the dog, the dog's actual existence and how it comes into this world. The very first thing that a dog ever does is it comes out of the womb and it gets cleaned by its mother. And that's a very, very significant part of the dog's life. And all of that is actually touch. Mm -hmm. Now, contrary to popular belief, 
Mandy, is all touch bad? Would you say that all touch is bad? No. So like this type of touch, would you consider that bad? Mm -mm. How about like something like this? Is that bad? No. But if I whacked you, right, maybe mm -hmm. that's bad. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't even want to call any of those bad. Really what I want to say is that they all have a purpose. Okay, mm -hmm. like this one might be used to like if I was behind you at a grocery store to get your attention, mm -hmm. right? The other one might be to say something like, I have sympathy for you. Hey, you're doing a good job. Maybe I give you a high five. Mm -hmm. And the last one might actually warn you about danger, mm -hmm. that there's something that you need to avoid. And so this is something that a lot of dog trainers kind of shy away from, that, that last feeling, the one that's uncomfortable that we should avoid. And mm -hmm. it actually, it's something that's really important. It shouldn't happen a lot, but it should happen enough to protect us from the things that could actually cause us to not be here any longer. So the very first language is pressure. Can you, can you name a pressure tool that dog trainers use? What's yeah. the pressure tool that I use this, on dogs? The slip leash. Very good. Yeah. So slip leash is a very common tool. If you've never seen one of those, just maybe drop down a question below and say, what is a slip leash? And uh, we'll, we'll pull that up. So a slip leash is, is, you know, it's a very nice tool, but it's, it's a pressure tool. Okay. So let me give all four languages and then we're going to talk about each one. So the first one's pressure. The second one that's the most relevant to the dog, and it happens within the first hour of the dog's life, is scent. Scent is a huge, huge deal to the dog. Can you tell me, like, so we were talking about Jersey, your dog, before the before we started. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular scent that you've ever noticed that kind of sets Jersey off? Or maybe, like, you know, obviously, does Jersey like her food? <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, so, 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 what yeah. do you, so what do you feed Jersey? Um, she eats Taste of the Wild, but she eats any food that I put in front of her. Have you ever have you ever asked her or you know given her choices about different foods that she can try? Um, like how did you like how did you decide that Taste of the Wild was the food that you wanted to feed her? Well, it was the food we decided on um, just because it's a good quality for all our dogs. Do you and do you stick with, with 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 one specific one? Do you just do like the Pacific Stream? Sometimes I change it up, but I have uh, one dog with kind of a sensitive stomach, so I have to kind of be careful. I the the Pacific Stream they do well on that one, so I get that one most. So I guess like maybe with a dog that has a sensitive stomach, okay, you might be seeing like maybe they don't enjoy like the Pacific Stream as much. They might enjoy some of the other yeah, some of the other yeah. ones. You know, and this is what I'm trying to say, folks, is that you know. Leash pressure and the smell of food is an extremely relevant thing to a dog. And anytime you're trying to communicate to your dog, if you have food or if you have, if you have food or if you have a leash on them, the chances of them actually understanding what you're going to say increase substantially. Would you say that your dogs are much more, uh, would listen to you better when you have a, a, have a handful of food? Oh yeah, well, yeah. definitely Jersey will, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and 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 a lot of and a lot yeah, of dogs I mean, are like that. Mo yeah, they mostly will. So the first two languages, which are the most important, whenever you're training your dog, uh, guys, those are going to be pressure and scent. And Mandy, which tools represent pressure and scent? Your uh, leash the and leash and food. The leash and food. Having those two things on you, like I said, guys, is really going to make a big difference whether or not your dog is really going to be able to do the thing that you want it to do. All right, so you've got pressure, you've got scent. The third language, and I'm going to talk about this one for a second. The third language is actually motion. So the way that you actually move your body has a lot to do with how a dog is going to determine what they're going to do next. If you've ever had a, a herding dog, like a German Shepherd, a Belgian Malinois, uh, an Australian Shepherd, any of these herding dogs, I see them as puppies and I see that they get in trouble a lot for excessive nipping. And the reason mm -hmm. that they're getting in trouble for excessive nipping is because as your kids and as you are moving your legs, which happens to be the things that are moving the fastest in the environment, your dog's canine brain will automatically say, chase that. There's nothing that, there's really very little that you can do other than to stop moving to get a dog to stop, to actually, a, a little puppy like that to stop biting you especially if they're well-bred. So a well-bred dog, you know, surprisingly, is going to, a herding dog is going to be nipping at you quite 
a bit. You know, have, do you have any experiences yes, uh, with this? Ranger was like that when we first adopted him and the kids were small. And um, yeah, he was constantly grabbing our hands. Did you do anything to kind of protect yourself from Ranger? Um, no, I mean, we just got, you know, got onto him, you know, like sometimes we would just, you know, put other things, but usually it was when the kids were running in from outside and running upstairs and anytime that someone was moving quickly, Ranger was gonna, and it didn't hurt. He was just, just putting, he just put his mouth on their hands and... And what I'll tell you guys, you know, Mandy says it doesn't hurt, and, I, and I, I'll take her word at that, but a lot of you guys are contacting us because the yeah. puppies have you guys looking like mummies, that your whole <laughs> arm is, is just bandaged up, and look, and, and I get it. Look, I'll tell you guys this as we're going through these languages of pressure, of scent, and of motion, and particularly motion, because that's the one that's going to lead to the nipping and the bites and things of that nature, is if you have a puppy, it's not a bad idea to wear long sleeve shirts and wear pants mm -hmm. okay i i wear a pretty thick hoodie when i'm going to be dealing with really mouthy puppies um, because i don't want the pain that they cause me yeah. to be a deterrent in the way that i actually uh, the way that i actually deal with them now yes i have told very young puppies that were mothered poorly you have to actually not bite me so hard mm -hmm. and just to kind of give everybody some context Mandy, what do you, how do you think the mom dog tells the three-week-old puppy that's nursing too aggressively to calm down? What does the mom she dog... Bites, she bites them. She bites them. them. She doesn't bite them to, yeah, to she, take their head off. You know? she, doesn't, yeah. you know, she doesn't bite them to eat them. She bites them with a bite that actually is going to get the dog to back off a little bit because she mm -hmm. loves her puppies, you know, mm -hmm. and she would, she would defend them. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's one thing that we see a lot, that maternal instinct is going to kick in. So guys, as we're looking through these languages, as we're looking at pressure, as we're looking at scent, as we're looking at motion, the reason that I'm gonna, I'm pausing there before the last language is those are the most important ones. Pressure, scent, and motion. If you actually learn how to use your leash, if you learn how to use the smell of the dog's food, and if you learn how to move your body, you can actually explain volumes to your dog. Mm -hmm. So what's the last language? We said motion already. So it's pressure, scent, scent. motion, mm -hmm. food, sound. Sound, sound. Sound. Yeah, synthesis. sound. The one that we're, oh my gosh, there's that huge thing again. <laughs> no, Jade. Uh, Jade? rescued that one Jade? this is another one Jade is are you a foster failure for that mosquito <laughs> hawk did you foster it failure so pocket. we have a we have a, like a huge mosquito hawk in here and I wanted it. I, 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 I allow Jade to save to save the uh, to save the mosquito hawk but it looks like Jade foster failed and it is back here in the environment it's over with back it. over with mommy it's fine okay yeah so because it just bumped my face and like I might have to eat it, you know, if it if it gets too close if it gets too close to me. So so look here we go again. Okay, so we have pressure, we have scent, we have motion, and then the last one is sound. Mm -hmm. As you look at my German shepherds, there goes Fritz into the other room, and you look at Gabby here. What's the unique feature of the German shepherds' ears? They're they're pointy. Standing, yeah. And the other thing, it's not the one that I was thinking, but pointing ear, pointy ears is an advantage. One of the things that a lot of these herding dogs, these dogs that do have the pointy ears, is that they can actually rotate. And it's almost that they can rotate to collect sound in 360 degrees. So why am I bringing that up? Well, look, I'm going to tell you guys this. When it comes to training your young dog or even your untrained dog, using your voice will never actually benefit you unless you time it properly. But here's why I love voice commands so very much. I love them so much for so many of the dogs, and any dog really, but so many of the dogs, because they have an ability to rotate their ears for the three, 360 degree effect, and they can hear you from anywhere. And if you've gone through the process of actually teaching them that that sound is important, what a great tool to be able to have at your disposal mm -hmm. uh, that you have a dog that will turn their ears forward, turn their ears back, and are listening for the slightest whisper from you. So, you know, have you learned anything just from having this? Like, maybe there's a couple of things that I don't think I've ever said and, and caught captured on the, on the camera before, but is there anything that you've learned 
from these languages from or just what I've gone over right now. Um, pressure, scent, motion, and sound. Well, the pressure thing, uh, I mean, I didn't learn it just now, but I mean, from you, I learned about, you know, the using the pressure at all to try to train your dogs. That's not something that I ever, yeah, I just think of food. You train them with food. That's about it. So, so what's the advantage, what do you think the advantage of training with food and toys and balls and those kinds of things are? Well, those are motivational for the dog. They motivate. I couldn't agree more. I, when I, when I, when I term this or when I put a term to it, I says you build value with food, petting and praise. So, and you should know this. Um, what do you build when you use a leash? Respect. You, you build respect. Respect doesn't mean abuse or anything like that. It just means that you have well-defined boundaries. And so having a well-defined boundary and then inside of that boundary that there is a ton of value is a fantastic way to train anybody. It's a great way to, to my employees or, you know, or any kind of relationship, putting a lot of value into the relationship of those boundaries, I think is a very important thing. And so, so anyway, guys, those are the first those are the first four things that, that I feel that are very important principles that everybody needs to understand. Um, I'm going to take just a small break for a second because, you know, one, we, we want to ask you guys for a little bit of a favor. Obviously, this is a small business. Um, we're doing this out of my home uh, in my, and in my kitchen. And one of the things that you could do that could really help us is you could actually share my content. If you share my, if you share this, if you like it, um, if you uh, tag a friend, I can't tell you uh, what that means for me. Uh, if you ever get a chance, you can head over to my website, which is LongoriaHouse.com, uh, and house is spelled the German way, H-A-U-S. If you go to my website, um, we have a tab on there that says dog training, and underneath there, you'll see that it says free dog, dog training. We give away a lot of stuff for free, not just, you know, the the uh, the prizes, like the one that we're going to give away this evening, but we give away a lot of free content. I'm giving away all the knowledge uh, that I have uh, just to really be able to help you to raise a happy and reliable dog. But hey, it, it means the world to me when you guys uh, when you guys share our content uh, and uh, share it with your friends. So thanks again uh, so much for watching. Uh, we've got some more topics to cover, but I'm going to go over again one more time the contest rules. If you're just joining us tonight uh, and you want to win a special prize that I'm going to give away at the end of the show, uh, you have to leave a comment uh, during the show. Say hello. Say something to that. Say something of that nature. You can also ask a question, and we will maybe take a few of those if time permits. Um, and then at the end of the show we're going to announce uh, the winner for our special prize. Now at that moment when we announce the winner, um, you have to reply back within one minute uh, with the phrase Longoria House Rocks. So if you actually uh, comment with that uh, within one minute, uh, then you will win the prize. If not, if you don't claim it in a minute, then we'll go to name a uh, random name number two. Okay, so we've covered the, we've covered the languages. So the languages are pressure, scent, motion and sound. So if there are languages, then that means that we have to actually communicate in a, uh, yeah, that means that there's sentence structure. Mm -hmm. That means that we have to put the languages in a particular order. The easiest way, guys, that I've been able to find to explain the languages and the, and the order to put them in are the first three letters of the alphabet, A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. So the letter A stands for the word antecedent. But it really, what is it? The A is the, are the languages. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, did, are you aware that there's an order, well, obviously you are now, that there's an order that you want to put the languages in? So like, should you start with sound first when you're going to communicate to your dog? No. When, when should you use sound in the terms of the languages? It should be last. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for that. I'm gonna, and as I go through this, I'm gonna give you the reason, but I'm gonna have to go through the entire ABC to show you why you would speak last before your dog does the second thing. So the first letter is A. That stands for antecedent. Those are the languages. Then the next letter is B, right? And that stands for behaviors. What do you think behaviors are? What you ask the dog to do or what you expect from the dog. Would you say that like, not jumping on somebody is yeah, a behavior? Yeah. It's real interesting because this is really common. Mandy's response is a super, super common one. 
And if you say it like that, that not jumping is a behavior, it actually isn't. I mean, jumping is the behavior. Jumping is a behavior. And this is a mistake that a lot of people make is they say, I want to teach my dog not to jump. Mm -hmm. And it, and in terms of logic, you can't actually teach a not jump. I'm going to show you how you actually fix the jumping problem with the last letter. But as far as behaviors go, here's kind of my pseudo scientific one. Behaviors are the three and four dimensional things that we're asking the dog to perform. That means that they just have to actually occupy space and they have to actually occupy a certain amount of time. Because if it doesn't occupy space or time, even the things that you don't want, if they don't occupy space or time, mm -hmm. then, it's, then the dog isn't actually doing it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something, that you wanna, that's something that you wanna understand is that behaviors occupy space and time. Like for example, my home, it has an address and you're supposed to be here for X amount of time. When you're talking to a dog, you wanna tell the dog like, hey, you've got to be in okay. X amount of space for X amount of time. So that's the behavior. So the A and the B, the antecedent, which is a language, and the B, which is the behavior, that is called a repetition. And a repetition, well, I'll ask a question. Do repetitions teach dogs? Well, I guess the answer is no. Okay, so what do you think? What do you think? The well, I mean, repetitions um, enforce or... They reinforce the knowledge that they've been taught. That's really close, guys. Mandy's really, really close. So each time that you have a repetition, it is an opportunity to reinforce. Okay. But it's not reinforcement itself. Have you, everybody here has heard of going through the motions. Mm -hmm. And going through the motions actually doesn't teach you anything. You're just literally going through the motions, mm -hmm. right? So when you use... When you have an antecedent followed by a behavior, you've got a repetition. Mm -hmm. So there's only actually one thing that teaches any of us, your dog and ourselves included, and that's the letter C. So the letter A was antecedent. Mm -hmm. Those are the languages. The letter B is the behavior, the specific thing that you're asking the dog to do, even if it's something you don't want the dog to do. And then the letter C is the most important one. At least I think, because this is the one that actually gets the dog to learn. And those are the emotional consequences. And I really mean consequence as the thing that happens after the dog has done a behavior. So like the consequence of the dog uh, doing a down when you point would be to get a good boy, to get a rub, and maybe to get a piece of chicken liver, right? Mm -hmm. But what about, what's the consequence for you open the front door and they bolt out the front door when they see a squirrel right there. What should the consequence for that be? So this is a really important, this is a really important thing is that you, we have to have consequences, those things that actually create the emotions in our brain in order for us to be able to have an understanding of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you, can you name any emotions that you think dogs might feel, Mandy? Uh. Anxious. Okay, anxious. Yeah. So that emotion? yeah, so yeah, like separate separation yeah. anxiety. Separate yeah, separation sadness. anxiety. Okay, anxious and sadness. Okay, so now you gotta you gotta go on the other side now. Okay, so you get anxious. They feel happy. They feel happy. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that's good. So, so look, I'm gonna so I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you some, okay. So you said anxious, you said sad, uh, you said happy. Well, let me break it down into four that reside in time. Mm -hmm. Pleasure, mm -hmm. hope. You could say both of those bring happiness, right? Mm -hmm. But like pleasure could be like, for me, pleasure would be like eating two pounds of crawfish. That would be pleasure for me. But comfort, what would be something comfortable for you? Like, or is how about the chair right now? Is the chair that you're sitting in comfortable? I could use a little more cushion. Yeah, it could. Yeah, yeah the chair could use a little bit more. Comfy? Yeah. It's okay. The the how about the back? Yeah. Not so much because it's this kind of this yeah, wood right here. Digging, yeah. So when when we're talking about these these emotions here, and we're we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but I I want to show folks that when it comes to sentence structure, having a clear way to communicate to the dog having the dog actually do something that occupies space and time, even if it's something you don't want the dog to do, and then that it's followed by 
something that actually generates emotion, that actually is the ticket to actually getting a, a dog to be able to learn from you. So if the dog, if the dog doesn't experience an emotion after the behaviors that you both want and don't want the dog to do, then there's nothing to be learned. And I would tell you a lot of times I watch people when they're in training mode with their dog and there's no actual emotional consequences. Mm -hmm. So they don't actually build anything. What What's significant in the ABCs to you? Well, the... You mean like... Yeah, like so I'm what... putting... Yeah, I'm putting you on the spot. And and I do this to everybody, and so just we'll be fair to Mandy, but I put everybody on the spot right here when we talk about the languages because I tell folks all the time, if you can't articulate to another human what it is that you're learning about dog training, then when you're using all these voice commands to the dog, how can you expect them to un how can you expect them to understand it? So what's significant about the language, like what's significant about the languages or what's interesting about behaviors that maybe you didn't understand? Or did you realize that there's motions that live in time and outside of time? Well, no, I guess. So anxiousness, you, you talked about anxiousness. Mm -hmm. Anxiousness is not actually in the moment. Yeah. Anxiousness is, is, is contemplating mm -hmm. the future, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what's the opposite of anxiousness? Uh, it's hope. Mm -hmm, okay. Yeah. When you look at both of these types of emotional states for dogs, like separation anxiety, the dog believes that nothing good is going to come of the, mm -hmm. you know, of the of the situation that they're in. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's really that's some, that's really powerful for a dog. It can actually lead to some really destructive behaviors. But when mm -hmm. you're talking about when you're talking about hope. Hope is the expectation that good stuff is happening. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a video on, a video here on YouTube that I watch every once in a while, and maybe I'll just uh, I might put it in its own playlist because it's it's just really fascinating by uh, a guy with a huge beard that has a PhD and just talking about the power of hope, and it's just really interesting that as uh, I think it was the study was done for uh, on on chimps or something like that. But a chimpanzee, when it was ex anticipating the reward, not didn't get the reward, but is anticipating the reward, that it was actually releasing 50% more dopamine than actually getting rewarded. And so the anticipation of mm -hmm. reward is a very, very powerful thing. Cool. So, you know, those are, I think those are, those these first two things right here, understanding the languages understanding that you have to use a language to communicate something that exists in time mm -hmm. and then after you go go through that that you have to attach some kind of relevant emotional consequence is actually the formula to getting your dog to learn anything uh, yeah. yeah regardless regardless of what it is mm -hmm. okay i'm going to go ahead and jump over into the next segment i do want to remind anybody that's watching um uh, we're going to cover the next segment next but uh, anybody that is watching, we do have a contest uh, for today. So please make sure that you leave a comment um, as we're going through this information. Just say hello, uh, say hi, ask a question if as if you have one. We'll maybe uh, answer one or two of those one or two of those questions at the end of this little discussion with Mandy. Um, but uh, yeah. At the end of the live show, I am going to be giving away a, a reward uh, or a, a prize, right? Yeah, yeah reward. I'm, yes, I'm in the dog training. A reward. Training. A reward. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to reward you for your attention. Yeah. Um, and so, um, if we get to the when I get to the end of the show, um, uh, I'm going to call a name. We're going to give that person up to a minute. Um, and if I and if you just say Longoria House Rocks in that minute, then we're going to give you your prize for watching. Uh, but hey, uh, thanks so much to everybody that's watching. Really appreciate each and every one of you guys. I hope this is uh, useful for you guys. Uh, really enjoy talking about dog training and really helping you to understand how to get the most out of it. So what we've covered so far, we've covered the four languages. We've gone over pressure. We've gone over scent. We've gone over motion. We've gone over sound. We've talked about that there's sentence structure. And so in sentence structure, you have your antecedent. Mm -hmm. That's the language. That's the part that's going to initiate the communication to the dog. After that, you have the behavior. That's the thing that you're actually communicating to the dog to do. And that could be the thing that you want and even the thing that you don't want the dog to do. Mm -hmm. 
And then the last part, what was the last part? The emotional, emotional consequences. Consequence. Yeah, and so the emotional consequence, that's the thing that tells your dog's brain, remember what led up to this moment, and it was gonna actually say, do this more and do this less. less. Yep. So that's the next point. So the next point is, is that you have to actually differentiate emotions. Okay. So all emotions, or all human and canine behavior actually obey two things. They obey the path of least resistance and the pathway to reward. Which one do you think is relevant all the time? The path of least resistance or the pathway of reward? I would guess the pathway of reward. Okay. Gracie, you know, Gracie's off camera here. What do you think? What which one matters more? Which one matters more to the dog? The path of least resistance or the pathway of reward? What which one no, and the, and the question is, let me ask it again. The question is, which matters to the dog all the time? The path of least resistance or the pathway of reward? Reward. Okay. Jade, what do you think? Reward or resistance? Which one which one is important to the dog all the time? I think reward. Okay. So the question now that I ask you, Mandy, can reward, can your desire for a reward be satisfied? I guess. So like, tell me something that you, yeah, tell me something that you like. Money. Money. Okay. <laughs> so if I was to, uh, if you were to, is a hundred trillion dollars too much? It's a lot of money, right? But yeah. could you actually really spend, could you actually no. really, no, you couldn't. You couldn't actually spend spend all that much money. Yeah, I I guess you could, right? But let's go to like money's good. It's really interesting about money, but it has a lot of value and it's a kind of reward. Now let's get more let's get more real. What do you think? Not more real, but let's get more basic. What do you like to eat the most? Mexican food. Okay. Can you eat twenty five enchiladas? Probably. Fifty? <laughs> uh, Can you eat fifty I mean, in one sitting? I guess I guess the appropriate answer would be no. No, but, but like, but could, but like, could you do that? It'd be uh, like fifty enchiladas. Like, I guess that's a lot. That's a lot, right? Yeah, yeah enchiladas are good. We we're actually thinking yeah. about getting them for dinner. But so, so here's the thing. I, I'm going to show you guys. I'm going to show you guys this. And so, I probably wouldn't enjoy number. I probably wouldn't enjoy them after forty. Seven. Yeah, you know, you would just be basically yeah. stuffing them in. Yeah. Would you be receiving any more any more benefit from it? No. Would Probably it begin to make you would it would it begin to make you feel uncomfortable? Probably. Okay, so here's the here's the point that I'm trying to make. Okay, because I think this is re this is real real basic and it goes to a dog very easily. So the one that's relevant all the time is the path of least resistance, because the pathway of reward can actually be satisfied. Mm -hmm. There actually comes a point where the reward can actually begin to not be rewarding whatsoever. It could be something that you really enjoy, but you turn off. Everybody that's watching this at some point in their life has maybe been nervous. And if you're nervous and you end up, uh, you end up uh, not being able to consume food because you're also to some degree uncomfortable, okay? So every, every behavior obeys the path of least resistance and the pathway of reward. And the one that matters to the dog all the time is gonna be the path of least resistance. However, the pathway of reward is for all the amazing, cool things that we do with dogs. That's where that resides. So when you look at these two pathways, you could say, you could say being frustrated and being un, uh, being uncomfortable. Okay, those actually move away from the path the path of reward, and they move into more resistance. Mm -hmm. Where if you look at comfort and pleasure, comfort obviously is less resistance. Mm -hmm. And pleasure is more reward. Mm -hmm. So, if you, anytime that you're looking at any dog behavior, let's say like, uh, let's say the cir the circumstance of somebody walking into your home and your dogs are jumping all over them, if your dog is moving in the direction of the person and is about to jump on them, you frustrate them by not letting them jump on the person. But then, as they begin to go in the direction, should they actually begin to become more uncomfortable? And if you do that, the answer the answer is yes that will punish the dog for the behavior. Mm -hmm. But then on the other side, on the other side, if you have somebody coming in your home, like you know, we, we all have uh, friends and family that are coming over, 
when that happens, if the dog actually sits by your side, should it be comfortable? Mm -hmm. And should it be pleasurable? Mm -hmm. And folks, what I want to tell you right there is that is the key to training anything is to understanding how to use your leash and your food to increase uh, to increase pleasure and comfort and to also deny your dog the food, deny your dog the toys, and use the leash to put some pressure on them. And as you do that, and as you speak, the dog then learns the value of your words. So we've, we've, now, gone, we've now gone over the four languages. We've gone over sentence structure, which is ABC. And what I describe to you right now is the way that I actually train practically anything that I teach a dog to do. I call that red, green, blue. Green is a zone where it's comfortable. And, it, and if, you, if I ask the dog to go into the green zone, then it's somewhat pleasurable. Mm -hmm. The blue zone is super comfortable and super pleasurable. But then as the dog moves away from the blue and the green, then it gets to being in the place where it's going to be frustrating and it's going to be uncomfortable. And so as the dog does that, then you see the dog begin to do things like this. Is there anything that you're thinking of that maybe you could begin to apply with your dog that, that could help them with the stuff that I've shown you so far? Yeah. Like, well, yeah, give me, give, me one, give me one circumstance that happens in your home that maybe you'd like to see a little bit less of. Uh, barking. Barking anytime excitement happens. Like, Would you say that the barking builds the barking builds more excitement? Probably because once one dog barks, then the other ones are like, "Oh, what is it?" Blah blah blah, you know. And then then all of them are barking, and it gets. So what? So what's your response? Like, so so how do you how do you try to address it? Like, do you like well, do you so yell or know, sometimes? Well, <laughs> yeah, I yell. Doesn't do any good. So we do have we do, we have one major barker and who is that? It's Harley. He's a forever okay. foster. Okay. But um, on, he anytime the dogs get excited or play, he just sits there and barks at him. Um, so for him, we did get a squirt bottle, and we rarely have to squirt him. But when we pick it up. You know, and it just has like the solid stream that, you know, hits his nose. And I know that the real trick I think I've learned to barking is that you have to stop it before it starts. You well, can't you, are, really you got, yeah, you really got to nip it. You really got to nip it in yeah. the bud. You got to nip it in the bud because once it, so what, whenever a dog, whenever a dog escalates in excitement, what do you think is actually working against us? Um, I don't. Syndrenaline. Yeah. Adrenaline. So like when you get adrenalized, your ability to feel something like this or even to feel the yeah. squirt from the squirt bottle, guess what happens to that touch? It goes away. It goes right? away. Yeah, that's an advantage that every one of us mm -hmm. has. You know, your dog has it. We have it. Your dog may even have it. Dogs may actually have it more than a human does. So as you begin to think about these behaviors about, you know, the path of least resistance, the pathway of reward and this problem, be, you know, this problem barking, as the barking builds and as the excitement builds, then even though the path of least resistance still matters, the dog, the dog is now able to tolerate that mm -hmm. to a large degree. So nipping it in the bud is actually a really important thing. A lot of the training that we do with you folks, you know, is really to teach your dogs how to have a calm type of lifestyle. So that way, whenever excitement comes in, that they tolerate the excitement instead of getting carried away uh, getting carried away with the excitement so what like what's the change that you could make you know like if you have this barking problem what's one change I mean, what's I, one change that you could make in the in the house i mean would... i always thought our you know maybe it's just too calm down there all the time so anytime something little happens it's like a big deal it's kind of how i mean we have a pretty calm late relaxed like the kids are usually upstairs so like if if one of the dogs is in the backyard and hears a noise and it makes one little bark the other dogs inside think that somebody just showed up and they all just get excited and so i mean how so i'll ask this how often do the dogs have to actually stay in an imposed stay and so and i think that i'll, I'll tell you this okay and i'm curious i i, I cut I, I asked you the question to to cut you off for a second because it's my guess that dogs that don't have an imposed stay on a regular basis, that they trigger, that they trigger faster. 
because there's no consequence for the dog to get up and you know yeah like because a lot of times like yeah it could be super calm in the home but then when they get up there's no consequence that tells them that i shouldn't have done that mm -hmm. there's only the you know i get excited the thing that caused the excitement goes away we won because we scared it off and now we come back down so now it's this whole we get triggered we escalate we escalate some more, we escalate some more, it goes away it, and it goes down instead of saying like, hey, we get triggered, oh, we can't get excited, we need to stay calm because the pack leader wants us to remain calm. Have you ever, you know, does that does that make, does that well, make yeah, sense? Yeah, That's yeah, kind yeah. of like my guess, but I don't, like I'm not in Yeah, I mean, I definitely home. don't do place training. I mean, so if that's what you're, you well, know, that's, that's, you know, Well, that's one thing, but does the place have to be on an elevated bed? No, I mean, like, I train with Ranger on his soft bed, but it's like, I don't really even have places for all of the dogs. Yeah. I mean, my issue is I have too darn many dogs. I well, yeah. Mean, yeah, well, a lot I, of people are kind of, kind of, the, so, so could you really put multi, could you put multiple dogs on the same place? <sighs> maybe. Yeah, you can. Maybe, yeah. You know, the, the thing I'll tell you guys, and I think the most practical thing that you can do if you have a barking issue going on in your home and you're trying to teach the dogs how to be calmer, is for a little while, 14 days, when people are home, the dogs actually are wearing leashes. Mm -hmm. And then and then this is a change that I think that we should all make for ourselves is as we're going through this, that the dog would actually... Uh, that we would end up when they started barking, that we would use their leashes and not talk and just corral them into a certain part of the room. And then, and, and then they would start getting the notion that, oh, the humans want us to calm down. And then once they actually are calm, start making, making it really awesome for them. I think that really will change a lot of, uh, you know, just that one piece of advice. It doesn't, you don't have to be really good at training. Your dog wears the leash, they get escalated, and then you use the leash to de-escalate them. You do it for 14 days. And you're, I would say you're, you know, 70% of the way there to actually having a dog that could do it on their own without any equipment. If you, pr if you practice that uh, to that length of time. And, and that just means that you just have a leash on the dog. Mm -hmm. Now, the downside to that is that every single one of them, if you can't get to the leashes in time, you're going to have a bunch of chew toys and you've got the ultimate tug match going between all the dogs with their, with I'm their just leashes. trying to imagine rounding up all those leashes. I mean, there's five, and there's yeah. usually only one. Well, or do you two ever people. see? Do you ever see? Do you ever see the? Uh, do you ever see the pictures and of like they, dog trainers with like twenty dogs yeah, walking behind them? Yeah, but here's them? the thing: we have a doggy door, and they start running outside. Yeah. Well, okay. When there's like one person That's there. That's right. No, it's challenging. Yeah. No, it's challenging I mean, it's for like, sure. Yeah, it's definitely. It's definitely. A, it's definitely a challenge. It's definitely a challenge to be able to to be able to deal with this. But as you begin yeah. to do it, like I tell people this all the time too, Mandy, is that the when you're trying to make behavior change, day one's always the toughest yeah. because you're you're actually fighting against against your behaviors yeah. Yeah. Uh, more so than you are fighting against the dog's mm -hmm. behaviors. Yeah, all right, all right. So we've covered a lot of stuff. We're gonna get. We're just gonna go over one more one more major thing, um, and then we'll begin we'll begin to wrap up for the evening. So the last category, the last thing is, is that there's actually categories of skills. What do you think the What do you think the basics are, Mandy? What do you think the three major categories of skills that a dog can do are? Do you have any idea? Oh, uh, lots of things. But as far as yeah, like, give me yeah, give me a I few. Mean, like, give me the give me a few. Come, what do you think the come and call? Okay, come and call. Okay, stay. Stay good. Um, walk by your side. Hey, very good. And, and you know, that's good. That's really good. And what I want to tell you guys is those are the answers. As you're thinking about it, it's actually a little bit more specific because you guys know me real detailed, right? Mm -hmm. But you're right. The, the, uh, every dog should be able to walk with their owner. Every dog should be able to come to their owner and their family. And every dog should stay where we tell them. Mm -hmm. But when you think about these, thinking back on the ABCs, you know, behaviors occupy space and time. When you're thinking about this, let's go over the stays. There's different kinds of stays. Mm -hmm. The place stay, mm -hmm. the down stay, the sit stay, and the stand stay. I believe that everybody should start with the place stay. 
okay? I think it's a really easy skill to be able to teach a dog, okay? Even if you just teach it to one it's dog. Yeah, if you, if you just teach it to one dog at a time, I think that it's a really good skill to start with. Which is a stay that almost nobody needs? The stand stay? That's right. Nobody really needs a stand stay, but if you're competing in any kind of dog sport, the stand stay is one of those things that are at the upper levels that your dog has to be able to do particularly well. Okay, leash walking. So there's four types of, uh, well, leash walking is one of the four kinds of movement that a dog can do with us. Mm -hmm. it's, actually, it's actually two of the kinds. Do you know the two different kinds of leash walking? Well, here they are. Short leash. What do you think the other one is? Loose leash. You got it. Short and slack leash. So, uh, short leash walking, a lot, of, a lot of you guys, if you're having issues with your dog and you need to move them, you know, just a few feet, use a very short leash um, and that can actually help you move your dog, help you move your dog just short distances. Don't be afraid of it being short. The thing that I would tell you with short leash walking is that if you're using that, uh, please be sure that you're not going for long one mile and two mile walks because that is a lot of pressure on the dog. Okay. Slack leash walking is a kind of walking that I think every dog should learn how to have. What do you think the other two types of walking are? Can you name one of the other two? Uh, I cannot. Off leash. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're both off yeah, leash. Yeah, yeah, Oh, yeah. Um, I can't think of it right now. But so like when Gabby and I are on the field for our dog sport, what do you think that's called? It's competition healing. Okay, healing, yes. Healing. Yes. Guys, I, I use a little bit different name for some of these. Um, so you'll hear me talk about walking and you'll hear me talk about healing. And that's just something that I learned many years ago that what a lot of people call heal um, the people in the, the snob people in the sport, myself included, um, we don't call that healing. We call that walking because it's just, it's kind of simple and a dog just mm -hmm. does that with you. Where healing is something that you really use to show off how well in tune that your dog is with you um, mm -hmm. and they're able to do that. There's a lot of similarities between those, but those are some major skills. So yeah, so what are the, what are those here? Repeat them after me because I make everybody do this. So okay. slack, uh, so short leash. Short leash. Slack leash. Slack leash. Slack leash. Off leash, off leash and then competition healing or competitive style you could call it whatever you whatever you want so the major category number one was stays mm -hmm. the place stay the down stay the sit stay the stand stay mm -hmm. and then there's the forms of moving with us which are same with me short leash short, short leash, leash slack, slack leash, leash off, off leash, leash and competitive healing and then what's the last major category of skills? And I would say that those are the come when called. I, a lot of dog trainers train this, and I think you should. The very first come when called that your dog should probably ever see is the one where the dog's actually facing you. And then they come, and then they come to you when you call them. Mm -hmm. Would the, the, the next level up, what do you think that one is? If the first one is the dog's actually looking at you, you call and they come, what, what should the second one be? When the dog's looking away from you. That's right. And this one's actually pretty difficult for a dog. That's why we have videos like the treat toss game that we just, we put a video out on that. Uh, I think, uh, was it yesterday or today? But mm -hmm. it's one of our newer videos here on the channel that really shows you in, in depth how I begin to teach a dog to come when called. Uh, I think it's a really great video. It is one of those uh, virtual reality videos. So you're going to get a lot of detail in that one. Um, but as you're watching that video, a dog needs to have the ability to hear their owner's voice, the specific command that the owner wants. And then at that moment, your dog actually go about uh, turning around and ultimately coming back. What do you think the other, one of the other types of coming when called is? So you've got straight line, you've got turn around and come back. What do you think the next one is? Uh, like when they can't, when you're not visible. Think, well, that's or? that's also the turnaround, the, oh, the okay. turn, yeah, because you're not visible. You're behind, and that's where the, you get to take advantage of what the 360 degree ears of yeah, the dogs. Okay. No, I don't know the other. Retrieving. Okay. Yeah, retrieving. You know, you throw something out, right? The dog goes out, can't see you, picks it up, and then they have to do it, and they come, okay. and they come back to you. And the last, and the last type of coming when called. Uh, 
is another type of retrieve, but it's retrieving where there is some kind of obstacle or hurdle. In the sport that, uh, that, I'm a, uh, that I participate in, we actually throw a wooden dumbbell over a meter hurdle and over a six foot wall. And then the dog has to jump or scale the wall. And then when they turn around, they can't see you. They can't see you because there's this big object in the way. Mm -hmm. And then they have to jump back with the dumbbell inside of their mouth and then present it to you. And so I think that that's the ultimate in coming when called. Mm -hmm. When you send your dog out, they lose sight of you and then they have to bring something back to you, whether they have to go through like swim a river or go over, yeah. the, go over a hill or climb some kind of obstacle mm -hmm. or something like that that is really, really challenging. So guys, there it is. There's a lot of detail in here. Uh, you know, we really shared a lot of things, but now I'm just gonna distill it down to those 13 pieces of information, okay? So here they are. So number one, okay, the languages, pressure, scent, motion, sound. Your leash, your dog's food, the way you move, and the timing of your voice are very, very important, okay? Now, the next thing, okay, is the sentence structure. So the sentence structure is ABC. You have to communicate in a language the dog understands. You have to translate into the languages that you want your dog to understand. The thing, then you have to have a thing that you actually want your dog to do. That's the behavior. And then your behavior will actually be remembered by the emotions, the emotional consequences that come after it. There's four emotions that we tend to control. Okay, We control pleasure. We control comfort. We control the dog being frustrated, and yes, we control the dog being uncomfortable. And as you show the dog that their different behaviors lead to different emotional consequences, that begins to build habit. Mm -hmm. Okay, The dog will avoid things that are frustrating and uncomfortable and will move towards things that bring pleasure and bring comfort. And so the last thing is, is that you have to train your dog in the three major categories of skills. You have to train stays. You have to train, you know, coming when called, and you have to also train a dog to move with you, okay? I think to have a very healthy relationship with any dog, okay, I think to have any, a healthy relationship with any dog, I think you need to have at least a play stay. I think you need to at least have a slack leash walking, and I think you need to have a turnaround and come back, okay? Well, guys, hey, I really appreciate each and every one of y'all watching this. Um, I'm going to keep my word. Looks like we had, a, yep, so we had a, we had a couple. There's a mom, you can't win, you can't win. <laughs> okay, but thanks to everybody, thanks to everybody that watched. But we're going to go ahead and uh, pick, uh, pick somebody. Well, there's, okay, good. There's two of y'all that, yeah, that, that are watching. Okay, so, so Gracie. great. So, Gracie, I think this is the part where you get well, to. There's only two on the list. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. Good. So, yeah, so now. Now you're gonna to get to pick one of those randomly. So, so, so if y'all are still watching, um, I am actually going to give away. Uh, I am going to give away one of these uh, Amazon Echoes right here. Um, as maybe some of y'all might know, or if you if you don't know, um, we actually have an application on the Skill Store. Or two, yeah, we have two apps on the Skill Store. Uh, for your uh, for your Alexa devices, uh, those skills. What they're doing is they will give you a fresh daily dog training tip that can really help you to raise a happy and reliable dog. Okay, and the other thing, and what what's that? What did she say? There was a question. Okay, yeah, and we're gonna get get to the question. Um, but there's a fresh daily dog training tip, uh, fresh daily dog training tip there. Um, but then the other thing that's really cool is that you can actually have me in your home when you need me the most. Uh, we have another skill called Al the Dog Trainer. Um, on that skill, uh, on that skill, you're going to be able to ask me questions. And sometime this year, um, as we're making these live shows, as we're producing content, you're going to actually be able to ask that skill a question. And it's either going to give you an audio answer if you have something like this. It could also give you a it could also give you a video answer. Or in the very near future, what I'm really excited about that it's going to be able to give you the answer in 3D virtual reality. So it's like there I'm in the room and I'm teaching you the thing that you're wanting to learn about. So I'm really excited about the prospect of that and where that's going to be. Uh, five years, ten years, and uh, five thousand years from now, right? So, so okay. So, uh, I guess did we did we determine who's going uh, who who the win winner is Andreas. 
All right. Well, okay, Andrea. Okay. Well, Andrea, I know I know I get to meet you in a in a few weeks, so I'm excited to see you. But hey, you have won. Um, you have to comment now with uh, if you if you're still watching with Longoria House Rocks. Um, and then yes, hey, I actually mailed out the last thing that you won. Uh, so I know you won. Uh, you won a prize for me. Yeah, she oh, really? she won a clicker. Well, no, oh. I gave her a clicker because she signed up for our newsletter. Oh, cool. So. Uh, Andrea, if you're watching, uh, Andrea, if you're watching, uh, you have one minute uh, to respond with Longoria House Rocks. Um, if you don't, uh, we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have somebody somebody else win. So, Andrea, if anybody knows where Andrea is, uh, she needs to hang around and and make a comment. Jade, how much is the lag right now, or uh, how much is the lag on the stream? Can we see? Because I want to make sure to be able to give her. Give her enough time to. All right, so look, I'll be fair. Look, she yeah. commented already. Does she comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. she still wins. Oh. Okay, yay! There you go. You win. Well, Andrea, which which color which color do you want? So I've, I'm gonna give you either what 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 color is this? Is that black or charcoal gray or what? Sure, do you, both. Well, like there's a there's a kind of like a white one. I know what color that is, and then yeah, there's, there's this black charcoal or white. one. So Andrea, which one which one do you want? Just go ahead and comment. Do you want the white one or the yeah the white one or the black one? And we'll get this ship we'll get this shipped out to you. <sighs> well, that yeah, Mandy, you thanks so much. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, so yeah, uh, so. Well, we just had a comment. It's not really a question. I'm not sure if she's looking for. Yeah, it's okay, so go ahead and read it out to me. My vet recently told me that grain-free food isn't good for our nine-week-old French bulldog puppy, and we also planned on doing a raw diet when he is older, but sh the vet strongly disagreed. Yeah, you know, so hey, there's a lot, there's a lot of opinions. Uh, there's a lot of opinions uh, in this area. Uh, I have some opinions as well. Um, here's, what I here's what I want to say, okay? So your veterinarian is, is definitely an individual uh, that should be trusted uh, when it comes to you know medical issues uh, for your dog. So I'm just going to give you my opinion. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not against the vet. I'm definitely not against the veterinarian, but I have uh, I, I look at it a little bit different way. So one of the things that I always consider is, yeah, like how do I want to say this? So I'll put it this way. I don't know that this is completely 100% true, what I'm about to say next. It's what I've been told. It's what I've been led to believe. So take it with, the, like, please take this with the biggest grain of salt, okay? The, at the vet schools, the classes on nutrition are being, uh, being endorsed, or what's the word I'm looking for? They're actually being promoted by one of the really big dog food manufacturers, Okay, so like I I don't have a problem in and of that, in and of that in the, yeah I can't even say that right now I don't have a problem with that in particular okay but they obviously you know the dog food company they they make food off of they make money off yeah. of selling this particular food they have a vested interest in teaching yeah. people about the nutrition that benefits them mm -hmm. um, and I don't actually agree that the diet that the diet that's being taught at the universities is actually the one that's best for the dog. I think that we should look at what a dog actually eats in the wild. I think we should look at what their ancestors ate. Um, so when it comes to raw food, I I stand with saying that a raw diet probably is the best thing to give to your dog. But you better really be educated about how to balance the diet properly because you got to get all the macronutrients right. You got to get all the micronutrients right. If you're going to say, I'm going to feed my dog raw and you put a piece of hamburger and a raw egg and you're going to feed your dog this, you're going to cause some problems. Okay, that is not the right way to go about doing raw food. You have to actually get fruits and vegetables. You got to get bacteria. You got to get probiotics. You got to have the right amount of, of bone. You got to get the right amount of muscle, the right amount of organs. Okay, and I'm no expert on this, but I know enough about this to say that, hey, you know, raw feeding, while it's extraordinary and I've seen the benefits, I've seen a dog. I, a, today, a dog won a dog show that I know that this dog uh, that this dog is raw fed um, and he's in exceptional health. Uh, I just really think that raw food is fantastic. Now, when it comes to grain-free food, I'm going to give you the advice that I give to all of my clients and it's pretty detailed. If you're watching this right now and you'll go, go, go grab your bag of dog food, 
there is a nutrition label on there. And as you read the nutrition label, you can look at the ingredients and see that there's ingredients. It's going to list all the different things that are on there. But when you look at grain-free, there's one thing that they're not actually telling you is the percentage of carbohydrates that are in the diet. So here's what I have found, okay? And this is just my own personal study for my own dogs. A lot of these grain-free foods, especially if there's a celebrity on the front of the bag of dog food, is very, very high in carbs. Like I actually looked at one yesterday that has a celebrity on the front of the bag, on the front of the bag, and it was 60% carbs. Wow. Now it was grain free and grains are a, a huge source of carbs, but there was other things in there, potatoes, yams and other things. And it was a lot of carbs. Now I feed a grain free food. Now I don't, I'm not getting paid to say this. I feed a grain free food. The amount of carbs in my food is between 30 and 35%. It's about a third of it. And so, what my advice to you is to do some more research, to go to, you know, to go to, you know, your local, some of your local pet stores. And I wouldn't even say the franchise ones, go to the ones that are owned by mom and pop. Okay. And talk to the people that are behind the counters there. Now, look, they're not medical doctors. Okay. But I really feel that the medical doctors are being influenced by some of the big dog food companies that are teaching them in the vet schools. Now, I, look, I love the vet. I love the vet schools, especially you know Texas A and M. It's a fantastic veterinary school. Um, but and I don't like I said earlier, I'm not sure if the big dog food companies are actually sponsoring their class. That's just what I've been led to believe. She said that the vet recommended IMs, which she was surprised to hear an IM too because. Look, I'm just going to tell you, I'll, I'll tell you this. If there's corn in the first three ingredients, if there's corn anywhere in the, in the label, I'm not going to feed it to my dog. I, I'm just going to give you a real simple example. We're humans. We have an appendix. It, it does absolutely nothing. That organ just sits in your body, okay? So if you look at the appendix of a gorilla, which a gorilla is eating, and like a koala bear, it's eating plants, the appendix is actually a pretty big organ because it makes the enzyme that actually breaks down the it breaks down the sugar that is in the in the in the leaves. So a human doesn't make that, and I'm going to tell you right now that your canine companion doesn't make the enzyme that breaks down any of the any of the the sugars that are in corn. Specifically, okay, so the sugar is cellulose. And the name of the enzyme is cellulase. And cellulase is made by your appendix. And if your appendix is a human appendix or a canine appendix, it does Oh, and I, you know what? Let me back up. If you have a human appendix, I don't know if dogs have an appendix. I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so yeah. Gracie. Can, yeah, Gracie's on that real quick. So look, I don't, I don't know if a dog has an appendix, but a human has one, and it does absolutely nothing. It's, the only, it's one of the organs in our body that does nothing. So, hey, I hope that advice is... Okay, so a dog has no appendix. Yeah, a dog has no appendix. They don't have a way to be able to make, to be able to make the enzyme that breaks down the sugar that's in corn. So there's my argument for that. I wouldn't feed it to my dog. Um, I'm not going to say I've never fed Imes, but I won't currently feed them. Um, I don't think that they're terrible. It's a terrible dog food. I just don't think that it's ideal. Well, guys, hey, thanks to everybody that watched this tonight. We so appreciate you. Uh, thank you so very much. Thanks to my team here that's with me tonight. Um, we love y'all. Thanks again. Have a great night. Take care.